Good morning, and welcome to the sanctuary of Cornerstone Assemblies of God. I am Pastor Richard T. Wade, and I would like to say thank you for joining us today. I pray the Word of God can speak to you, and the Holy Spirit make it real to you. Now, a pre-recorded message from Cornerstone Assemblies of God. Amen and amen. You may be seated if you can, but worship team's not going to leave just yet. I asked them to sing a, a little chorus before I preach this morning. Last Monday morning, or this past Monday morning, ever how you want to say that, Allie and I were sitting on the front porch and drinking coffee. It was nearly too hot to do it, but we were suffering through anyway. And this chorus... It's really a proverb, but a course began to run through my mind. The name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous run into it, and they are saved. And so I was trying to put the song together in my mind, but I couldn't get it. And so I'm like, babe, there's a song, and it says, The name of the Lord is a strong tower. And she said, yeah, and the righteous run in, and they are saying, blessed be the name of I said, yeah, that's it, that's it, you know. And so she starts singing it for me on the front porch. And so all week long, that's just run through me. I shared a little bit in one of the early morning prayers I came up. We talked about it. Wednesday night, men's uh, ministry time, uh, it was. Steve was teaching and preaching, but that came up again. And I was talking with somebody over lunch on Thursday, and that came up again. And so just that phrase, that one line, and of course I had already gone to the Word and, and saw that it was Proverbs 18 and 10. And that's what it says, it says, The name of the Lord is a strong tower, and the righteous run into it, and they are saved. And so I'm going to preach on that here in just a second, but I thought, let's just sing. We're not going to sing the whole, all the different courses and everything, but we're going to sing, blessed be the name of the Lord, and we're going to sing this proverb. And so y'all just go ahead and lead us through that real quick.
Because your name is our strong tower. You are the refuge, the rock, our firm foundation. Today, Lord, we give you glory and honor. We magnify you. We know that your word will not return void. And so I ask, Lord, that you would anoint me to teach and to preach your word. That you would cause your glory to come forth and to be made known. That you would give us an ear to hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. Give us a heart to receive it and a resolve to do it. And we give you the glory and the honor for it. In Jesus' mighty name, amen and amen. Well, you may be seated if you stood back up or whatever, and so that's fine. If you want to know how the preacher finds victory, that's it. What y'all just what y'all just witnessed. The Lord will give me a song. He'll give me a psalm. He'll give me a proverb. And I just start singing it in key, out of key. It don't matter. Just sing it. I make a joyful noise unto the Lord until I just feel better. And, and it's, well, how long do you got to sing? Sometimes it's days. Sometimes it's weeks. You just keep on singing and keep on praising and keep on giving him glory. And victory will come. Victory will come. Because the name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous run in and they are saved. Amen. This morning's message, I entitled it, The Name of the Lord Is. Is what? That's the point of this morning's message. I handed them a list of scriptures this morning. There's always a, we don't really bet, we don't gamble around here, but there's a running bet that the preacher won't preach all the scriptures that he gives us. But I'd rather give them too many than not enough. I mean, I'd hate for the Lord to still have some preach in me, and I ain't got no more word. And so I'm glad that I always got more word than I got preach. And so anyhow, we just, we, we, I handed Mary, well, actually, before I handed it to Mary this morning, I walked in her office, I said, take a deep breath. She's like, what? I said, I'm not preaching all of these, but I am going to reference them. <laughs> and so it's this long. And uh, I think Mary had rolled it up like a scroll and threw it out before Sister Catherine when it was time to put it into the program. But no, this morning I pray that I can encourage you. Say, so you've been preaching awfully heavy, preacher. You've been growling at us and scolding us. And it's not you individually, but it's the church at large throughout our nation is sick as a whole. There's a lot of things going wrong. And, and the only way we're going to address it is to address it. The only thing that we're going to address within ourselves is sometimes to be a little uncomfortable. And, and I give God glory this morning, and I really mean it. There's some Sundays I get through here, and I'm thinking, man, Lord, that come out a lot meaner than I was planning on it coming out. And then somebody will call me throughout the week, and I say, man, what you preaching is right. Oh, it stepped on my toes. I mean, that made me, made me have to realign something. I thought to my, but then, but then they say, but thank you. Thank you. We, I don't want to just come to church and just hear something. I want to be challenged. I want to be stretched. I want to be forced to think about, and I'm like, well, praise God. I, I, I didn't mean to come out as mean as I did, but I know that it did. And I'm glad that the Holy Ghost anointed it with grace and planted it in some people's hearts because he can do far more than I could ever dream or imagine. And so this morning, Proverbs 18.10 is the basis of this entire message. And the Lord has just blessed me in it, and I pray that it can bless you. And so before I go any further, I want to preach this verse to you. It says, The name of the Lord is a strong tower, and the righteous run into it, and they are safe. And so the name of the Lord is a strong tower. Well, what is a strong tower? Well, we're talking about a fortified building. We're talking a, a fortress, something with thick walls, and it's tall. It's a place where in the midst of war, you can run into it, and you are safe from the attack that is outside. It is a place of refuge when there are even times of peace, but there could be the threat of war. You stay in your strong tower. Well, not everybody in the world gets a strong tower in the natural, it is typically authority. It is people of stature, kings and queens and royalty. They have their strong towers. The, the president, you know, he has a safe room and, and he has a, a bug out room. And now in today's world, a lot of us have them too. And so, but a strong tower, Jesus is our strong tower. So you may have your bug out room, as we like to call them, at your place where you got a 
storm cellar or something that's buried and dug up and full of food and ammo and everything else and there ain't nothing wrong if you got one. I don't. We used to joke, say we was going to go to William and Judy's because they had, you know, all those generators and all that stuff on propane and that big hurricane, you know, fence and the gate. And I said, well, if anything goes wrong, we're going to Brother uh, Williams. And then they turn up and sell it. So now we've got to go to Fred and Deb's. And so, you know, they're the next bug out people. They really got it. Their house is underground. First time I pulled out there, I thought, I thought they built a house. And then I'm like, oh, wait a minute, I see a roof on top of the ground. And you walk around, it's like, oh, there is a whole house here. It's built into the side of the hill here. It's a wonderful place. And so these are strong towers. These are bunkers. When there's a storm, where do you go? The storm shelter. When there's a war, where do you go? You go to the bunker. When there's a threat of something, where do you go? You go to your safe room. You go to these things. Anytime something could possibly go wrong, you go to your shelter, your, your strong tower. Jesus is your strong tower. So don't wait for war to break. We don't wait to see a funnel in the sky before you go to the storm shelter. Have you ever seen the movie uh, Twister? Didn't you learn anything from that? No, when they say take shelter, go ahead and take shelter because we don't want you to get sucked up while you're running across the yard trying to get to shelter. Well, that's the thing about Jesus. If we would stay in him, if we would continually walk with him, he is our strong tower. It's not saying storms don't come. It's not saying war don't come. It's not saying attacks won't happen. But what I am saying is no matter what happened, I am protected because I am in my strong tower that is Christ Jesus. This proverb goes on to say that the righteous run into him and are safe. The righteous Yes, the, the, the lost need to come to Jesus. If you don't have a relationship with Jesus, if you've not made him Lord and Savior of your life, that is step number one. But see, the unrighteous do not have the promise or the privilege, I guess I should say it that way, not a promise. The unrighteous don't have the privilege of Jesus as strong tower. Jesus is a strong tower for the righteous so if you want the benefits of jesus being your strong tower then you've got to come into the household of faith you've got to come into the kingdom of god you don't get god benefits without being in relationship with god and so the unrighteous don't run into jesus who is their strong tower no the righteous run into him and so this morning you know this preacher is not going to preach without preaching holiness you can't just skate through life and expect Jesus to be your strong tower. No, the righteous run in and they are safe. The next point that I want to preach on this one verse. They run in. It didn't say that that strong tower plucked up its foundation and started chasing them around. They have to run into the safe tower the strong tower the bunker the storm shelter you got to get to it it don't make that's what we often do as christians tornado comes you got an f4 running through tearing up rip and we stand out in the front yard and we look at it and then we get dead and everybody wonders i wonder why they is in the driveway when they have a storm shelter three feet from their back door. Well, yeah, I had that storm shelter. Spent good money in it and had it installed and go down every month and shop vac it out and spray for spiders so they won't kill me while I'm in there. It gives me good, warm, fuzzy feelings to know I've got my storm shelter. But it don't do a lick of good if I'm not in it. That's kind of how we are in our Christian living. It's good to know that Jesus loves me. It's good to know that he is my strong tower. It's good to know that he's more than able to deliver me from anything I need deliverance from. But if I don't run to him, 
If I don't keep myself in right relationship with him, if I don't learn his word to know the promises that he's given for me, what good is it to call myself a Christian? That's like having a storm shelter but never going in it. Had an aunt one time. She had a storm shelter. It was an old one. It was there when she bought the house. She never went into it. It scared her. But a bad storm come in one evening, and she decided she was going to go get in that storm shelter. And she opened up the door, and it had about three feet of water in it. That's what we also do. We wait until the threat of death is on our door before we try to run to the shelter. But the shelter is not properly prepared because we've not spent a life preparing it. We don't know what word to stand on because we don't know the word. We don't know what God can or can't do because we, we don't know the word. We don't really know how to get to God because we don't have a prayer life with him. We don't have peace because we're not going before him. We've just lived life and, oh, yeah, I got a storm shelter. I got a storm shelter and then it's time to get in and it's flooded. Does good to go out there every once in a while, make sure the water's pumped out and the spiders are dead and there's a case of fresh water. Your batteries aren't corroded. These are things that happen. You got to tend to it. We need to tend to our relationship. We need to stay fresh in the Word of God. We need to stay in a place of prayer. We need to stay in His presence so that He can rub the corrosion off of our batteries. See, the name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous run into it, and they are safe. They are not safe outside of it. They are safe in it. And how do you get in it? You run to it. We oftentimes want Jesus to chase us around and tug on our coattails and beg us to come into right relationship with him. The power and the presence of the Holy Spirit will convict. He will draw. Jesus says, if I be lifted up, I draw all men unto me. But there's a difference between drawing and chasing. Something. He does not force himself but he will always draw. The love and the presence of the Spirit is there saying, Come, whosoever will, let them, what? Come unto me. I looked to see exactly how many names of the Lord there were in the Bible. And commentaries all give me a different... Every commentary give me a different number. Some said as few as seven. Some said 140-something. One said 200 and something. And so I, I, I have not taken time to get a highlighter out and count every name that I would consider a name of the Lord in my Bible from cover to cover. By the end of the year, I'll have that done for you. Uh, but but uh, not for this morning's sermon. But um, I got to looking, and the reason there was such a large number is the one who only give us seven, they only would use the names that God give himself that he said, I am this. And then some of them that were, most of them that were well over a hundred, they as probably where I'm more in line with because they would see names given to God by the prophets and the leaders and the people of old. You see it. And then the one that was over 200, I mean, if it said something about healing, it would say, see, Jesus is healer. Well, yes, Jesus is healer, but it also says over here he's healer. So you've counted that name two or three times. You get what I'm saying? So I can't tell you this morning how many names the Lord has. But I can tell you there's a bunch of them. And I'm going to probably give you 40 or 50 of them this morning. Because I want to encourage you this morning in just exactly who God is. That's the reason that list of scriptures was this long. is because we're going to reference them. And so I want us to, you know, go ahead and, and let's look at... Uh, Exodus 3, verses 13 through 15, because I've, I've already preached to you Proverbs 18 and 10. And so here in, in Exodus 13, uh, 3, verses 13 and 15, Moses is at the burning bush, and, and all of this has taken place. You, you know the story. The Lord has told him to go back to Israel, and he says, well, 
they're, they're going to ask, you know, what's his name? So Moses asked the Lord, what is your name? And God answers him, you tell them that I am who I am. I am that I am. Tell them I am has sent you. And so when you look at the name here, the, really the first name that is the Lord himself declares for it is I am. And the Lord is plainly saying that he is whatever and whoever he needs to be. There is zero, and I put that in my, I wrote a big zero. There is zero limitation to who God is. He is all things to all people. He transcends all time. He always has been and he will always be. There is no beginning and there is no end. That's how he transcends time. We can't comprehend who he is because he is so bigger. Just as big a God as you can imagine, it ain't nothing as to who he is. When he's saying, I am, You tell them I am sent you. He is saying I am without limitations. In Exodus 33 and 19 and Isaiah 42 and 8, Yahweh declares that his name is the Lord. In Isaiah he states that he will not yield his glory to another or his praise to idols. He says I am, there it is again, the Lord. I am the Lord. When he adds the Lord to the I am, he is declaring I am ruler over all things. There is no authority beside me. If there is an authority that shows up, I trump it. I am the Lord. Not just a Lord, I am the Lord. The one, the only, other people can call themselves Lord. You can make things Lord of your life. But when it comes down, when it's all boiled down and sifted out, he stands firm as the one who is the Lord. He will not share his glory. That is a a beautiful thing that I saw here in Isaiah 42. It says, I will not yield his glory to another. See, the Lord doesn't apologize for being who he is. He is God. He is the Lord. He has declared his way. He has declared his will. And whoever likes it, praise the Lord. And if they don't, they best get in line or get over it. Because he is the Lord and he has declared his glory and he yields it for no one. See, he, he's kind of just says it plain. There, there, there really is no discussion is what he's saying when he says, I will yield my glory to no one, nor his praise to idols. He is a jealous God, and he says, I am the Lord. Lord over everything and anything, anywhere, anytime. Philippians 2, 9 tells us that the name of Jesus is the name that is above every name that has ever been named or shall ever be named. Really, when when Paul writes this, the Holy Spirit giving it to him about the name of Jesus being the name above every name, Isaiah had already made it clear, Moses had already made it clear in Exodus that the Lord is, I am the Lord. And so they are declaring he is the Lord. There is no name that can be named has been or will be that supersedes the authority of who God is. And so this morning I'm teaching to you, preaching to you, hopefully and encouraging, and hopefully we will by the time it's over with, that the name of the Lord is whatever it is you're in need of today. In Genesis chapter 17, verse 1, God appears to Abraham when Abraham was 99 years old. And he says, I am El Shaddai, God Almighty. God Almighty. So you have, he's the I am. He, I am the Lord. And then he just puts a bow on top of it and says, actually, I'm just El Shaddai. 
I am God Almighty. I am the Mighty One. In Matthew 9 and 12, he is the physician. In John 10 and 11, he is the good shepherd. Prophets had called him many names throughout the centuries. Isaiah 9 verse 6 says that he is a wonderful counselor. He is mighty God. He is an everlasting father. He is the prince of peace. Micah 5 2 says he is a ruler of Israel. Zechariah 3 8 says he is the branch. And then Jesus himself in John 15, 15 or 15 1 says, I am the true vine. And so you've got Isaiah saying he is the branch. And you've got Jesus himself saying, I am the true vine and my father is the vine dresser and whoever abides in me, in me. Oh, there we go back to, and the righteous run into it. And they are, how do you, how do you get safe? You got to be in him. He is the strong tower. He is the true vine. He is the branch. He is, I am the Lord. He is almighty God. This is who he is. He is the ruler of Israel, wonderful counselor, everlasting father, and the prince of peace. The name of the Lord is whatever it is you need it to be. In Isaiah 7 and 14, he says "I he is Emmanuel. We know that being translated as God with us. So the name of the Lord is Emmanuel. He is the God who is with you. In Revelation 5, 5, it says that he is the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David. Well, when I read that, I had to pause and think because another scripture come to my mind. When I read that he is the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David. Now, wait a minute. All throughout the Gospels, he is declared thou son of David. And so here he is, the root of David, and also he is the son of David. And so then that made my mind go to Revelation twenty two thirteen, where it says he is Alpha and he is Omega. He is the beginning and the end. Not only is he the son of David, he's the very root of David. He is the ruler of Israel. He is the Lord God Almighty. So what do you need Jesus to be this morning? Who do you need God to be for you this morning? Some of us need the healer. We're going to get to that here in just a second. Sometimes we need him to be the provider. I'm going to get to that too. Sometimes we just need victory. I'm going to get to that as well. Because he is the I am. He has zero limitations. The name of the Lord is a strong tower. Righteous run into it and they are saved. So when we began to declare the name of Jesus, bondages have to break, sickness has to flee, sin has to go, because the name of Jesus is a strong tower. It is the name that is above every name. Daniel chapter 7, it talks to him about he is the ancient of days. In Genesis 1.1, he is Elohim. It says, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. But see, that's in English. When you look at it in the Hebrew, it says, in the beginning, God. In the beginning, Elohim. Elohim, the supreme one, the mighty one. So who, he, he is what? He's alpha. What's that? The beginning. In the beginning, God. That's what, 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 well, what was in here before their God? Well, when did he begin? He's God. He always has been. Well, what's going to happen when this all this over with God? Because he always will be. He is everlasting. He even calls himself everlasting father. See, everlasting. In the beginning, Elohim. He is the beginning. Psalms 57, 2. El Elyon. Most literal translation. Is God might high. El Elyon. That is E-L. 
another word, E-L-Y-O-N. The most literal translation is three of our English words, God, might, and high. We translate it, God or Lord, most high. So we'd say the Lord most high. But at the most literal translation of the Hebrew, the Aramaic root word is three of our words. He's God, Lord, the supreme one. He is, see, El Elyon, that is Elohim, the supreme one. He's supreme. Overall, God, might. He is full of strength. He is full of power and high. And so when you look at the word picture of the name here in Psalms 57 and 2, it says, well, I don't say that up there. Well, I know I can't really read Greek and Hebrew, and neither can y'all, most of you, at least that I know. If anybody in here can, let's visit and study the Bible together. And so I just have to use a lexicon. <laughs> I'm not as smart as I sound. I read, to, I read six books to figure out this one word. And so... <laughs> I'm just being honest. But I will cry unto God most high. God most high. El Elyon. God might high. Genesis 16, he is El Ro- 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 Roi. When I read it, I'm, I'm hick and it made me happy because I thought God's a hick too because it says El Roy. <laughs> I knew God, I knew Northeast Texas and Southwest Arkansas was God's country because God himself names Elroy. The God who sees me. The God who sees me. Elroy is how you would say it, but I like Elroy better. The God who sees me. So don't you ever let the enemy lie to you that you're all alone. Don't ever think that you've gone so far that God can't reach you. Don't you ever think you've gone so deep that God can't find you. He is Elroy. He's Elroy and he sees you. He is the God who sees you. He is God Almighty and he is there. 1 Samuel 24 and 8 Dealing with David and what is going on here. He is the master. And the word there translated is Adonai. Which is sovereign Lord master. He is Adonai. He is sovereign. He is Lord. He is master. I give you the scripture reference because I know it's in English and you're saying, I don't see this nowhere in there. Well, that's because these words, when it's talking about God and who he is, David also afterwards went into a cave and he cried to Saul saying, my Lord, the king, my Lord, the king is Adonai, most sovereign Lord, master. That is who he is, is a sovereign Lord and Master. We in America don't like this kind of terminology. Because a sovereign Lord, Master, that means he's the boss. He's really in control of this situation. You give your opinion and you do what you want to do, but you'd be best served to just sit down and shut up and do what he told you to do in the first place. Because he is the sovereign Lord and Master. I'm guilty of it too, believe it or not. It's easier to believe, isn't it? You mean you run your mouth? Genesis 22 and 14. And Abraham called the place Jehovah Jireh. The Lord provides. Jehovah Jireh. The Lord is my provider. So this morning, I don't know who's needing something, but I can tell you that when you call out on the name of Jesus, when you call the Father on the scene, He will show up and He will be Jehovah Jireh for you. 
Exodus 15 and 26, he tells us that he is Jehovah Rapha. The Lord heals. He is the God who healeth thee. He is more than able. And so if you need a healing in your body, he's able because his na- the name of the Lord is Jehovah Rapha. The name of the Lord is in Exodus 17 and 15 is Jehovah Nisi. The Lord our banner. The Lord our victory. That's what that means. But it's not our banner. It was the banner that had the crest of the kingdom on it. And they would wave it high after they had won a battle. And he had given a promise that I will fight Amalek until the ends of the generations. And I will be victorious. I am your banner. I am your victories. Don't try to do it on your own. Know that I am God and I am fighting this battle for you. I am Jehovah Nisi. I am your victory cry. I am your victory banner. I am the checkered flag that says the race has been won. It is over. He is Jehovah Nisi. The Lord is our banner. Ah, Judges 6 and 24 says that he is Jehovah Shalom. The Lord our peace. Isaiah reminds us that he is the prince of peace. So when we look out at our world and we see all the calamity and the chaos, sometimes when we look in our own situation and it just seems crazy, know that he is God and he is the God of peace. And if we'll just hold on, if we'll remember that he's the master, remember that he provides, remember that he heals, remember that he is our victory, then the peace will come. Then you can look at Psalms 23 and 1 and you see that he is Jehovah Ra. The Lord, our shepherd, he is the one who will lead us. He is the one whose staff will extend and draw us back in. Here's that word again. Draw back in to nudge and to guide, to lead us on the straight and the narrow. He is our shepherd. He calls himself, Jesus does, the good shepherd. Well, a good shepherd doesn't leave his flock astray. A good shepherd don't allow his flock to go hungry. A good shepherd don't leave them without sustenance. Oh, they might be out there buying because they want something, but that's just because they're greedy. Now I'm meddling. Hmm. I think of those hens every time we go out to collect eggs or do anything. Allie's got them spoiled because she's got this little fancy scratch they like. It's got some corn, and it's got their grub worms, and it's got some little goodies in there for them. And so they got a feeder full of feed. They ain't hungry. They got a seven-gallon waterer out there with water. They ain't thirsty. They got a house. They They got everything a stinking chicken could want. But you get so far out in the yard... And they just think she's coming with that Folgers coffee can. They come flocking to the gate. They just standing there looking, ready for something. Like they starved plumb to death. They ain't eight in weeks. No, they're greedy. They don't want the good protein medicated medicine that's over there in the feet. No, they don't want that. They want that worm. They want them corn husk. They, they want that good stuff. That's what we are. We're the same way. Oh, Lord, don't give me the good stuff. Don't, don't give me the sustenance. I, don't, I really don't need anything that's going to cause me to mature and grow. Just give me the fluff. Tell me everything I ever want is going to come to pass. And just tell me I can live life ever how I want to and still somehow make it to heaven even though you call the righteous to run into it. Oh, yeah, no, no, we're out here looking. <laughs> and that, that's how the church is. We're just looking for the next person with the coffee can of goodies. The feet are sitting over there empty. Not empty of food, empty of people. Ain't no chickens over there with their heads stuck in that feeder getting what's going to keep them alive and cause them to grow and got the omega and everything else to cause their eggshells to be good and hard. No, they don't want that. They want that mess that's just going to blow them and let them die. You can't give them, but just a little bit at a time. Just one little handful. 
That's what I'm giving you this morning. Wait a minute, you're scolding us right now. Well, I'm your pastor. I done threw you a few handfuls. Now we're going to dig a little bit. Huh? Because he is our strong tower. He is, he is our refuge. He is healer. He is provider. Glory to God. Yes, he is. But he's also God and he's called us to be holy. He's called us to be doers of the word. Glory to God. He's the good shepherd. Jehovah Ra. Jeremiah 23 and 6. He is Jehovah Sidkenu. The Lord our righteousness. See we walk around in the authority of Christ. Talking about how we are the righteousness of Christ. Yeah get that right. We are the righteousness of Christ. Not my own. I'm his righteousness. He's the righteous one. And because I have entered into relationship with him, because I live by faith in him, because he has deposited the Holy Spirit in me, then I get to walk around and proclaim righteousness when really I'm broken and undone. But he is the righteous king. He is the Lord and the sovereign one. So therefore, he is Jehovah Sidkenu, the Lord, our righteousness. Ezekiel 48, 35. He is Jehovah Shammah. The Lord is here. The Lord is here. Here with us. It says it was around about the 18,000 measures. And the name of the city from that day shall be the Lord is there. The Lord was there. The Lord's here. Jehovah Shammah. The Lord is here. Do you know that this morning? Worship team, if y'all come back. The Lord is here. He's here. Romans 8, 15. He is Abba, Father. The Lord is here, and he is Abba, Father. The name of the Lord is Abba, Father. Everlasting Father. Almighty One. Oh, in Luke 2 and 21. And his name shall be called Jesus. Savior. Savior. So I'm telling you, the name of the Lord is Savior. Today, I've not given you the exhausted list. There's still even more. But the name of the Lord is Strong Tower. The name of the Lord is I Am. The name of the Lord is the Lord. The name of the Lord is Almighty God, Physician, Good Shepherd, Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace, Ruler of Israel, the Branch, the True Vine, Emmanuel, the Lion of Judah, the Root of David, the Son of David, the Alpha, the Omega, Elohim, the Supreme One, the Mighty One, the Beginning, El Elyon, God, most high. He is Elroy, the God who sees me. He is Abba Father and he is here. And so this morning as our worship team begins to lead us into some praise and some worship this morning, just really just I asked for this song. It's El Shaddai. Allie used to sing it all the time and I I go to the third heavens every time that she does because it declares who he is and so this morning I'm going to ask you to stand to your feet and again I've not given you a total list but today we can know who the Lord is he is who you need him to be and so while we all have different needs this morning Our situations may look different. If you've never made Jesus Lord and Savior, what you need is Jesus. If you've been serving the Lord a year or two, 
what you need is Jesus. You've been serving the Lord 20 years. You need more Jesus. There's some in this room that's been serving the Lord the better part of a half a century. And you know what they need? Still some more Jesus. Because He is here. He is here. And He is supreme. And His name is Jesus. Savior. Thank you so much again for taking time to listen to a message from the sanctuary of Cornerstone Assemblies of God. We do this through the help of our listeners and friends in the community. If you would like to donate to our broadcast, you can go to cornerstoneatlanta.tv and give as the Lord would lead you. But again, I, Pastor Richard Wade of Cornerstone Assemblies of God, just say thank you for taking time, and I pray the Lord make this real to you today.